Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to rise this afternoon and speak in response to the budget. And going to cover a wide array of topics in this response, Madam Speaker, but I think first and foremost, what I want to talk about is Ukraine and how I believe that as provincial politicians, we have a huge responsibility and we need to be more aggressive in doing more and much, much more to help with refugees who have already began arriving in Manitoba. And that's a mistake the minister made earlier today in question period. He's not even aware that Ukrainian refugees and displaced Ukrainians have already begun arriving here in Manitoba. Madam Speaker, it's heartbreaking, the war that's going on right now. And our Ukrainian population is continuing to grow. And that is why we have this responsibility to go forward and do everything in our abilities to help. And this includes making the transition smoother. You know, I still receive emails to this day, and this war has been ongoing, Madam Speaker, of people wondering how they can come to Manitoba. Are people allowed to just buy a plane ticket and land here and then figure out the logistics? There needs to be clarification, Madam Speaker. We need to talk about post-secondary education, and we've been asking about this in question period, but those who are displaced from Ukraine who happen to be students, one, will their education be recognized here in Manitoba? And two, are they going to be able to continue on with their education, recognizing that people who are coming from Ukraine, all they have are the clothes on their back. They don't necessarily have the funds to begin education and paying for post-secondary education, especially at international rates, Madam Speaker. These are the conversations we should be having because they are provincial, not federal. I'm so sick of this provincial government continuously blaming the federal government for immigration backlogs. They have a role to play too, Madam Speaker. We can also talk about childcare. We know that we need spots for childcare in Manitoba, and this is before the war in Ukraine. What's going to happen now, Madam Speaker? And with the pandemic sort of releasing and people heading back into their workplaces, we need to ensure that parents who want to go back to work have places for their children to receive childcare. And we can talk about housing units. Again, this has been talked about in question period, Madam Speaker. Those who are coming to Manitoba, are there housing accommodations set up for them? Are there, whether it's rent assist programs, and in my opinion, it should just be free housing for refugees coming into Manitoba. We know that we have buildings that some of them need some fixing up, Madam Speaker, but we have facilities in places. We have houses, we have empty houses here in Manitoba that could house refugees, yet none of these conversations are happening. And again, it's a role of this provincial government. Housing is a provincial topic, Madam Speaker. Another thing we can be doing is lining up displaced individuals from Ukraine with jobs here in Manitoba. Let's make sure that when people arrive in Manitoba, their skills are lined up with jobs in demand. We want to ensure that people can continue to pursue their dreams and contribute to the economy in the best way that they can and they know how to and they want to, Madam Speaker. And talking about refugees, that sort of leads into the provincial nominee program. And I always like to give a very small history of the provincial nominee program. When it was first introduced, it was under the Philman government, and it was actually a terrific program. I want to give credit to that. Provincial nominee program ran successfully for many years. Hundreds and thousands of immigrants came to Manitoba under the program with no wait times, with no head taxes, nothing like that. And it's because of the provincial nominee program that our province is the great province it is today. You think our Filipino community would be what it is today without the provincial nominee program? Not a chance. Our Indo Canadian community, not a chance. And that's why this government has a responsibility to make the program what it once was, a stronger program that allowed more individuals to come to Manitoba in a smoother process. And, and I fully, I want to recognize, I don't want to give all the credit to the Conservatives when they first introduced it under the Philman government, because then the NDP came into power, Madam Speaker, and frankly, they destroyed the program. Wait lists were up to five, six years. I remember when I first got elected in these chambers over six years ago, Madam Speaker, learning about how people have been waiting to hear back from Immigration Manitoba on whether or not their application would be received and accepted. Imagine being, for the sake of the 
this argument, Madam Speaker, in the Philippines, applying to the program five years later saying, well, how should I plan my life accordingly? How do I plan to move ahead when their application is on hold over and over and over again? Madam Speaker, it was a mess. And so then this government gets elected and we uh, had some fun protests. I remember sleeping on the floor of the Manitoba legislature. It was a wonderful experience, Madam Speaker. And those wait lists got cut down. And that's awesome. I want to give the government credit for specifically that, cutting down that wait list. But with that, they decided to bring in this $500 head tax. And it's not justifiable, Madam Speaker. It is, they are ripping people off, quite frankly. It's not fair. We know that the program ran successfully in the past without the head tax. It's a cash grab. And I think that this government needs to revisit that and completely remove it. Madam Speaker, about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago now, MP Rechi Valdez, she's uh, the first Filipina MP, Madam Speaker. She came down to Winnipeg and she came and she sat with me at my weekly McDonald's, which was awesome. She got to meet some of my constituents in the heart of Tindo Park. And then we went over to PCCM, the Filipino Community Center, where we had a big round table discussion with probably about 30 or 40 different people in the community. And we talked about immigration, including the provincial nominee program. We talked about applying for jobs that are in demand and that are still relevant online. There's a big mishap happening where people in different countries will go online to apply for the provincial nominee program and say, hey, look, this job is in demand. They will apply under that job only to find out when their application is finally being processed, that job is no longer in demand. This isn't lining up, Madam Speaker. It's, there are many, many cracks in the system. I also want to talk about, talk about accreditation of education and jobs. Madam Speaker, a lot of people who are choosing to come to Manitoba, they have a great education and they were working in their fields uh, of passion and that they have gone to school for back in different countries. And allow me to share an example. A lot of the healthcare workers here in Manitoba, or people who are qualified to practice healthcare here in Manitoba, they started in a different country. They went to school for years and years. They practiced. Some people practiced for 20, 30 years. They had full-fledged careers, Madam Speaker. And then they come to Manitoba, and it's not recognized. So instead, some of them go back to school, and some of them decide to work at other places. And man, like I, I just think about how badly we could have used, and we still need, these healthcare workers, especially through the pandemic. So education and job experience needs to be better recognized. Madam Speaker, we need to ensure that certificates are not being wasted. If specific files, for whatever reason, are not going through, we know Manitoba is given a certain amount of certificates every single year for provincial nominee programs. And I'm curious how many of those certificates end up being completely processed. And Manitoba has a role to play with international students, ensuring affordability and accommodations. And we'll talk about this in a bit more detail shortly. So with all of these needs, why was immigration pathways decreased by over half a million from 7.576 to 7.060 million? And the Fair Registration Practices Office, it was reduced from 513 to 478, Madam Speaker. It doesn't make any sense with the high demand of immigration coming to Manitoba. Why are these programs being cut right now? I also want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about infrastructure. I mentioned the PCCM, so we'll start with that. They have a very small space for storage, Madam Speaker. As a result, they're facing limitations in their abilities. So if this government were to invest in PCCM, their ability to host parties and cultural events would be enhanced. And most importantly, our Filipino community, which has now exceeded over a million people in Canada, Madam Speaker, would benefit from this. I've also talked a lot about the Kamigata Maru Park, Madam Speaker, and how when the area first began being developed in 2016, the initial development plan implied that the residents of Car Umber Trail would have a recreation area named Kamigata Maru. However, once residents began moving in, they were surprised to discover that there were no plans for the park. I strongly believe that the city has a big responsibility and role to play in this, Madam Speaker, but I'm hopeful because of the significance of the Kamigata Maru that this province will take some initiative and help contribute, whether that be through the Department of Sport, Culture and Heritage or through the Department of Infrastructure, 
to this park and to the community. Lastly, Madam Speaker, I'm hoping this government will consider Tyndall Park Community Center, very much in the heart of Tyndall Park constituency, Madam Speaker, and is a very popular community center in high demand, used every day by different sport groups. I know every time I walk in, sometimes you see jerseys for a hockey team, sometimes you see uh, soccer balls, whatever it may be, Madam Speaker. It's used by cultural groups as well as justice groups. Lately, when I go there, it's because I'm joining Bear Clan Northwest, a wonderful group. And the second one is, uh, Madam Speaker, 204 Neighborhood Watch, who go around to different areas. But whenever they come to Tyndall, they allow for me to join in with them. But these groups, they patrol the area, and they pick up paraphernalia, and they help out children, they provide snacks to people, and more importantly, Madam Speaker, they really assist in the everyday activities. I've been with them where they are unshoveling fire hydrants in case there was a fire and we needed quick access to the fire hydrant. They also shovel people's driveways, especially for seniors who need to be able to get in and out of their homes. They've even cut grass in the summer, Madam Speaker. So these groups are much more than just patrol groups. They go out of their way to service the community. And one of the things that they do whenever I go walking with them is they educate me on the community needs. And one of these needs is reconciliation. I continue to learn how there needs to be a commitment to working in partnership with First Nations and especially to sharing resource revenue. And this budget fails to address this. Madam Speaker, at 1.30 today, the Auditor General released a report and because we were in question period until now, I didn't have the opportunity to read the whole report, but I did read the press release, Madam Speaker, and I'm tabling it now. And I'm just gonna read a couple of uh, lines from the press release from the Auditor General that came out again today, Madam Speaker. The title of the press release, the government of Manitoba has not fulfilled its commitments to reconciliation. The audit found the government has not developed a strategy for reconciliation, which is required under the act Without a strategy, efforts towards reconciliation are hampered, ultimately lacking focus and vision. In addition, the audit found reconciliation efforts were lacking cross-government coordination, and there was no direction given to the departments. The Act requires each cabinet minister to promote measures to advance reconciliation through the work of their department and across Canada. Of the five departments examined in the audit, only the Minister of Indigenous Reconciliation and Northern Relations had any significant mention of actions to advance reconciliation in their most recent mandate letter. Madam Speaker, this is a perfect example. Reconciliation is a responsibility all of us have, not just one department inside of the Manitoba Legislature. Madam Speaker, I want to pivot a little bit. Back on uh, November 22nd in 2016, we started to call for a seniors advocate here in the province of Manitoba and spoken about it in many different contexts, response to throne speeches, budget responses, question periods, member statements, whatever it may be. And, you know, I, I think it is starting to pay off because recently the NDP decided to support it, which is absolutely fantastic. It warms my heart, Madam Speaker. But now we need this government to support it. And they are talking about it more. They're talking about senior strategies. And so I think we're making progress. So I really want to continue to encourage those who have reached out to us keep pushing, keep reaching out to your MLAs. It's really, really important. We've seen how helpful and productive the seniors advocate can be. We talk about how this extends much beyond the pandemic, Madam Speaker, with the long-term care facilities, ensuring people are in the facilities that best suit their needs. It's often uh, lost between the lines that personal care homes are not the only long-term care facility. We also have supportive housing homes. We have retirement homes. And these all need to be part of the conversation conversation, Madam Speaker. I know home care has become an enormous issue. And in addition to home care, Madam Speaker, home repairs. Home repairs for seniors is actually something that I've been learning a lot about, specifically over this pandemic. I've learned about seniors who cannot leave or enter their homes because they need a ramp, and so they are feeling isolated, and senior isolation is up more than ever, Madam Speaker. I've learned about seniors who are having trouble having a shower during the day because they don't have a bar in their shower to hold on to. These little, tiny home repairs, small investments, Madam Speaker, will enable seniors to remain into their homes ultimately five, ten more years, but instead, this government won't help fund any of these 
small home repairs, which leaves many people here in Manitoba with their hands tied. And they are then forced to leave their homes and go into housing, whether it's units or long-term care facilities, that in the long run are much, much more expensive, Madam Speaker. So we do need to do something at a provincial level, because again, housing, provincial issue. Seniors, we have a department they like to brag about is just for seniors. So let's make it so seniors can remain in their homes, Madam Speaker. They deserve better. And our students here in Manitoba, they deserve better too. I want to thank everyone for everyone in the education, Madam Speaker, education system, Madam Speaker. It's not just teachers, but teachers are right up there, but it's everyone who works in our school, who works in the departments for their incredible work and how adaptable they have been throughout the entire pandemic, Madam Speaker. We've heard about people and teachers having to pay for school supplies out of the, their own money, Madam Speaker, because this government isn't giving them enough resources. We've heard about the need for child nutrition meals and how evidently children do much, much better in school when their bellies are full, Madam Speaker. And we do have a responsibility to ensure that children in Manitoba are being well nourished. If we talk about high schools, we can talk about how students have had to sacrifice graduations through the pandemic. Some have had to postpone traveling, going to post-secondary, Madam Speaker. And what has this government done? Not a lot, Madam Speaker. If anything, they've deterred people from going to post-secondary. We can talk about when this government first came into power, they got rid of the tuition rebates. Madam Speaker, these tuition rebates were often a form of revenue for students when they graduate to put a down payment on their first house. And we know the housing market's only going up. These tuition rebates were often used to be able to pay for a vehicle once they graduate post-secondary school, Madam Speaker. These rebates were extremely important and it's a form of incentive to encourage students to stay here in the province. And we gotta talk about healthcare for international students. This government has decided to charge international students for healthcare as if international students aren't already paying enough for their school fees. Madam Speaker, it's absolutely ridiculous. It is completely uncalled for. We need to be grateful for our international students and everything that they contribute to our economy, not be charging them more. It's completely backwards. We can talk about faculty retention, and I'm not even gonna waste my time on Bill 64, Madam Speaker, but I'm noticing my time, and I do wanna share a couple of thoughts. I wanna talk about MAPS. MAPS is a student group, Madam Speaker, and they have been trying and trying to get a meeting with the minister responsible for education, for post-secondary education, and propose an idea they have that would actually save this government money except the minister won't even have the courtesy to get back to them. What is happening? These are post-secondary students and student groups, and the minister responsible won't even respond to them? And I wanna talk about the Canadian Federation of Students too. They were kind enough to actually provide me with some of their thoughts, and they share, this is about the budget, Madam Speaker. And they talk about how 15 million in government funds, while the Department of Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration receives a total budget of 1.6 billion, why do students continue to see no return on investments? There's no plan for international student health care. See, they're passionate about it too, Madam Speaker. International students continue to be excluded from publicly funded barrier-free health care. Private for profit health insurance coverages coverage results in high upfront cost to individuals, fails to accommodate for emergency care, and denies coverage to those with pre-existing conditions. Talk about the lack of on-campus mental health supports. Students continue to take on heavy academic loads and rising tuition in the middle of the pandemic, Madam Speaker. And many students work from the front, on the front lines or in precarious jobs. So accessible and on-campus mental health supports are essential for their success. Madam Speaker, I'm going to table some of these, uh, I gotta get a few more copies, and then I'm going to table some of these excellent points that CFS here has actually made, and it's just their responses to the budget. And I recognize I'm running out of time, I only have 42 seconds left, but I have so much more to say on childcare and climate change and mental health. Madam Speaker, we need much longer time to be able to respond to the budget, and overall, not impressed, and thank you for the opportunity.